gentlemen, inside the Borg, and free from the hive mind, this is Rex Bear, hosting Leap Project. The Leap Project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news. With over 90% of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates, many people today are looking for more accurate information. The Leak Project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drain media. Check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news, current events, on scene video footage, interviews, and most importantly, the truth. Tonight's guest is Kathleen Martin. She's a well known UFO abduction researcher, author, and lecturer with over 23 years' experience in the field. She is MUFON's international director of abduction research. Also, in 2012, she was a recipient of MUFON's. Research of, er, researcher of the Year Award. Kathleen is author of three books in the field of UFOlogy, and her articles have been frequently published around the world. Kathy has appeared in television and radio programs in the U.S., Canada, and the United Kingdom, and is recognized as the world's leading expert on the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case. Hey, Kathleen, how are you doing? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I'm fine. It's great to be with you tonight. Uh, we're just really looking forward to this. I know your time is very valuable. Uh, so uh, we'll try and get as much data and information as possible here with the two hours that we have. Um, okay. I'd really like, if you could, tell us a bit about yourself, please. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that uh, I devote nearly full time to my position with Mutual UFO Network as their international director of abduction research. It's been a big job setting up that position and protocols and procedures for doing uh contact experience investigations uh, in MUFON and building that component uh, because it was very, very weak when I took over, but it's so important. And in addition to that, I do a lot of writing. I have a lot of articles on my website. To, um, I'm starting work on a new book and uh, I just stay really, really very busy you know, tracking down ETs and uh, trying to find out what they're up to. Wow, uh, that's that's about the coolest job you can have as far as being a UFO hunter. With these experiences that you have had the opportunity to hear about, your aunt and uncle was Betty and Barney Hill, is that correct? That is correct, and I was 13 years old when they had their experience. Betty was my mother's older sister, and I heard about their close encounter on the day they arrived home from their trip on September 20th, 1961, and I've been following it ever since. Geez. When you saw them, what were their expressions like? Well, I can tell you two days after this occurred, we were down at their house. My parents, my two brothers and I drove down and heard the story firsthand, and uh, their reactions were different. Betty was very, very curious. She was a lot like me, and she wanted to get the answers. She knew almost nothing about this subject. She had never read a book on it, regardless of what the debunkers say. They're always saying, oh, she was a science fiction fan. She was a, a UFO uh, enthusiast all of her life. That's complete nonsense. Uh, she was not. Uh, in, and Barney was a complete skeptic before this happened. So uh, Betty was uh, looking for the evidence, testing the evidence, and Barney was more reticent. He, he, was, he found this far more distressing. And I think the reason for that is that he is the one who had conscious, continuous recall of observing non-human entities looking down at him. They were humanoid in form but not human. And those were in his earliest statements to investigators. So this distressed him greatly because he feared that he was going to be captured like a bug in a net, he said to Walter Webb, who was the first investigator who interviewed him on September 20, uh, October 21st, 1961. Jeez, a bug in a net. Yes, yes. He, uh, he, was, he feared for his life. You know, that sounds so hopeless. Saying something like that just goes to show you the helplessness that somebody like that uh, must feel when they get uh, abducted in any case. Wow. Yes, and you know what happens to bugs when they're caught in nets for entomology classes. There's a pin that goes through them, and they're put up on a board. So, you know, I'm sure he feared for his life. 
Geez, yeah, absolutely. Did he describe them to you more than uh, just the humanoid figures as far as uh, the... The initial report. And uh, he sat and talked quietly with my father on that day. Uh, but in the initial report, he stated that they were dressed in black, shiny uniforms, that they moved with military precision, that one stayed at the window and stared down at him. And he found that being to, to be very threatening in appearance because it, he got the idea from him that uh, the plan was to capture him. Uh, the others turned to a panel on the back wall, and he could see them from about their knees all the way up to the tops of their heads through binoculars. And uh, in shiny black uniforms, he thought that, uh, you know, they were probably some type of extraterrestrial military group. Well, and you've heard a lot of speculation that the military actually works with uh, different extraterrestrial races. So did he see military personnel also? No, Barney did not see humans on that craft. And let me say something, because in his first hypnosis session with Dr. Benjamin Simon in 1963, this was February of 1963, when he had a powerful ab reaction, he started to remember an experience where he was that frightened in the past. Dr. Simon was doing hypnoanalysis with Barney, and he instructed him to compare everything he stated, all of his emotional feelings, to something that happened to him in the past. So this comparison was of a time in the past when Barney uh, saw a Nazi officer. Barney served in the Army during World War II. He was a truck driver. He was wounded in an explosion. He was released. Uh, after two years in fair condition from the wounds he received. So it was that experience standing in that field in Lincoln, New Hampshire in 1961 that reminded him of the fear he, he experienced uh, when he viewed a Nazi officer. And that was the comparison. Never again in the hypnosis or in Barney's conscious memory did he ever mention human being? And people get this confused, not only that Nazi statement, but also people think that humanoid means human, and it does not. It only means there's a head, there are two arms, there are two legs, and there's a torso. Okay, so it could be from a different time, a different solar system. I mean, there's a multitude of questions people might ask. And did he ever find out where they came from? Uh, yes. Wow. It, it, they didn't tell him. In fact, they communicated with him very, very little. It was Betty who, on the craft, and this came out under hypnosis, but um, they had only one examiner on the two examine both Betty and Barney. And there was a time frame where Betty was alone in the room with the person that she called the leader. And they had finished her examination. She began to trust this being. And she said to him, I know you're not from around here. Where are you from? Where's your home port? And he produced uh, this three-dimensional image of a star map. And that star map had stars on it. Some were as large as nickels. Others were only pinpoints. And she understood that some of those stars uh, had lines between them that were trade routes, and others were expeditions. Now, Dr. Simon, during her hypnosis, gave her the post-hypnotic suggestion that she would be able to draw that map if she could remember it accurately, and if it didn't bother her too badly. She did draw it, and then Marjorie Fish saw that map in the first book that was ever written about their experience, The Interrupted Journey. It was written in 1966. So uh, Marjorie Fish ended up uh, going to the university, uh, State University in Ohio, uh, going to the astronomy department, uh, checking out their, their catalog. She had to keep them in the department. They wouldn't permit her to take them home. But she hand copied all of that distance data and because they didn't have photocopy machines back then. She took the information home 
and she built 26 different three-dimensional models seeking a match Betty's map. She used monofilament line and beads, and it took her four years to finally find a match. And in one of those three-dimensional uh, structures that she built, doing all the math to do this, she had 256 stars in their proper location. This woman was a genius. In fact, she was a member of Mensa. Uh, it was an extraordinary project that she set out on. And finally, when new distance data was released, she had a perfect match. And then it came time to have it vetted by scientists. And that's when my co-author on the book captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience, Stanton T. Friedman, a nuclear physicist, came in. He was called in to find uh, astronomers who would vet the map. Alan Hynek was one and also the chairman of the astronomy department at Ohio State University, a Dr. Mitchell, vetted Marjorie's work. And also another person was David Saunders, who served on the Condon Committee. He was the one who discovered the trick memo, uh, and uh, it became public that uh, the Condon project was all about debunking UFOs and, and uh, letting the Air Force get out of it. But I'm uh, getting onto a different topic, our map. Uh, they discovered, Marjorie Fish discovered, that the two probable stars that they might have come from were Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 uh, in uh, the constellation, the net is what it's called. It's in the southern hemisphere, and those stars are about 29, no, 36 light years. Had that mixed up in my head for a minute. About 36 light years away from our sun. So did they get here from some type of portal or did they use some folding space mechanism? You know, they didn't tell <laughs> Betty and Barney how they got here. But uh, obviously they were using technology that we have not yet invented. And I know how difficult it is to travel through space when when you're thinking about cosmic rays and your gamma rays and you're thinking about all of the things that space is tossing at you. But we have theoretical physicists who are working on this right now and have theories for how this is done. And if there is an electromagnetic field around that craft, and I can tell you I'm not a physicist. I've only taken one course in physics, but, and that was a long time ago. But uh, they have it explained so that this craft would be protected by this electromagnetic field and might be able to sense anything that's coming toward it and avoid that as well. The beings inside, that presents another problem. Are they going to be alive and in eating and everything else in that craft? for the period of time it would take to arrive here. Uh, perhaps they go into a state of suspended animation and, uh, and then wake up somehow. They're activated when they arrive here on Earth. And certainly uh, you've heard about wormhole theories and that sort of thing. So uh, it's going to be very, very interesting as we learn more about space uh, to to find out exactly what it is they are using. But maybe they'll let us know in advance, too. Some people say they've already told them. Possibly. And when you said that Betty and Barney had different feelings based upon the people that they were interacting with or the, um, I guess, you know, extraterrestrials that they were interacting with, were they different looking as well? Or did they look the same uh, as oh, far as humanoid? Yes. Betty and Barney interacted with the same group, the same crew. Um, it's only that Barney was more, felt more threatened um, because he had conscious recall. And that's what was so distressing to him that caused him to end up seeing Dr. Benjamin Simon in the first place. Um, Betty was, hadn't observed them. She didn't remember uh, what they really looked like or what they did until after she was hypnotized except for she had a series of dreams, which was different than somewhat similar, but a lot different too than, than what she stated under hypnosis. Right. So what exactly did they do to Barney and to Betty? 
they uh, took them out of the car. Um, there was a roadblock. And the funny thing is that they heard a series of buzzing sounds on the car after Barney uh, returned to it from the field when he was so terrified about being captured. He went speeding down the road. He told Betty to look up. She only saw a black void, no craft. They heard these series of buzzing sounds. And all of a sudden, they found themselves in a new location on a different road. And, and this is under hypnosis. And they didn't know how they'd gotten there. There were tall trees all around. I'm wondering if the magnetized spots that they found on the trunk of their vehicle that caused a compass needle to spin and spin, actually caused by that craft picking that car up and depositing it on a new road. Wow. And then in directing Barney somehow uh, through mind control to drive onto the road, the dirt road, and to stop. They remembered what seemed to be the craft depositing, I think, uh, these ETs into the road and then the craft moving around to land. That's in one of Barney's original drawings in hypnosis. So I think that that's what's happened as I recon have reconstructed this in my own mind. They took them from the car. Betty tried to escape. She was terrified at that point uh, for her life. She tried to run into the woods, but they intercepted her. Uh, they rendered her unconscious. Barney was taken from the car. He, could, he felt like he was floating, but only the tops of his shoes were bumping along on the rocks on that terrain through the woods that they were taking them uh, to through to the landed UFO. Uh, Betty resisted. Uh, they rendered her unconscious again. Uh, when she resisted, she uh, kicked one of the ETs, and that was how she ended up tearing her dress. The hem was torn down on one side. The lining was torn from waist to hemline. They're taken in. They're put in separate examining rooms. Uh, they did pretty much the same examination on both of them. They were very, very interested in their skeletal structures, in their joints, the way their hands moved, their feet moved, their fingers, their toes. They uh, took hair samples. They took skin samples. They looked into their eyes. They took uh, the samples from their ears, their noses, their mouths. They opened their mouths up. And they checked their nervous systems as well. And they placed Betty on a table and told her that they were going to do a pregnancy test on her and produce this very large needle. She said, no, it's going to hurt. Uh, he said, it won't hurt, and he plunged that needle into her navel, uh, causing her excruciating pain. Dr. Simon had to end the session early. Uh, Betty was so traumatized at that point. So uh, Betty, uh, in, under hypnosis, was as traumatized as Barney was when he stood in that field. It's just that she didn't have these conscious memories that Barney had. Um, so... Yeah. When you sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to ask real yeah. quick. When you say they told them what they were going to do, was it speaking to them or was it telepathically? Well, that it's interesting that Dr. Simon asked uh, how they understood them. They both said they understood them in English. He said uh, their mouths moving, and they said no. Uh, they could understand them in English with a little bit of an accent, but no no movement of the mouth. So, and they didn't see tongues or anything like that inside their mouth. So, I mean, do you call that telepathic? I guess so, uh, unless there was some kind of uh, device that was used for communication. Uh, but that's the way they understood them. And I have to tell you that years and years later, and I hope that everybody is listening to this, because there's a video on YouTube. It's the lost interview with Betty. Uh, this was not too long before she died. And uh, she was asked about communication, and she said, oh, we talk to each other just like you and I talk to each other. That is not what she told Dr. Simon. That is something that, that changed in her mind somehow years later. And I can tell you she had a very large brain tumor when she died. And so I did notice changes in her memory, changes in her behavior that I believe are the results of that brain tumor. So that adds more confusion to all of this, really. Do you think the brain tumor could have been caused by the abduction? 
Oh, I doubt it. Okay. I doubt it. Now, I mean, when, anything is possible, but. <laughs> sure, no. sure. When you talked about the car and the magnetic spots on it and yeah. how it would cause compasses to act uh, sporadic, did they do any type of radiation tests on the car or the clothes? No one thought of that at the time. You know, no one had been abducted that we knew of back then. The uh, investigators really didn't know uh, too much about what to do except for to, uh, to question them. Later okay. on, years later, somebody came up with a radiation detector, and they went up to the landing site, and I believe they did pick up some radiation there, but Betty didn't own the car any longer at that point. Sure. And that equipment is also quite expensive to purchase, and you know, there, a lot of people couldn't afford it. And how did the mainstream media pick up on this? It wasn't until 1965. Um, it was through as a result of a violation of confidentiality where uh, a Boston newspaper reporter uh, lived in the same town as a, a friend of Betty. And Betty had told that friend some, um, confidentially what happened, uh, also what happened on board the craft. And I believe there were many stories about that, but I have some evidence that causes me to believe that that friend violated confidentiality and told, gave that information to that newspaper reporter. He then got in touch with Betty and Barney, used the friend's name in the letter, uh, said, she says that you're a very nice person and, and uh, I'm really looking forward to talking you, to you if you're as nice as, uh, as she says. And Betty and Barney were definitely not as nice as that. They were extremely upset. They went to a lawyer uh, they said, we're going to lose our jobs if you, uh, if you expose this. Do not write about this. And they thought they were fine. This happened in September of 64, no, 65, September of 65. Uh, at the end of October in 1965, the articles ran in the Boston Traveler for five days in a row. Betty and Barney were horrified. Uh, they thought they were going to lose their jobs. At that point, Barney had been appointed by the governor of, state, of the state of New Hampshire to serve on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission State Advisory Committee. He, he had an important political uh, position in the state. He was also the chairman of the board of directors for the Rockingham County Community Action Program. So uh, he had a lot to lose. He and Betty thought they were going to lose their jobs. She was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. He worked for the post office. Fortunately, they didn't lose their jobs. However, <laughs> a lot of people began uh, to wonder, not those who knew them, but those who didn't know them, began to wonder if they might be eccentric. Uh, you can imagine the, the kind of impact it has on someone when they've had this kind of experience and it becomes public, especially if they're well-known and held a fairly important position. Well, sure. Was it difficult for their friends and family? Did they disown them or make it difficult to, did, did they not call them anymore or come around after that happened? Uh, no. Friends and family continued to support Betty and Barney. I'm, I mean, I'm their family. So, yes, we, we were very supportive. Uh, we, they came to my grandmother's house, grandparents' house. I grew up across the street from my grandparents. We sat down as a family and decided what to do about all of this. And at, by that time, John G. Fuller, uh, an author who wrote The Incident at Exeter, he also wrote for Look Magazine and exposed the Condon Committee's hoax in Look Magazine, had approached Betty and Barney at that point, and asked if they'd be willing to cooperate with him on writing a book about their experience. So we discussed that as a family. Um, we thought that since it had already been released to the public and the consequences were not that bad, it, maybe it would be worth telling the rest of the world what really happened to them. So Dr. Benjamin Simon, renowned psychiatrist uh, from Boston, who they saw for a period of several months, uh, joined in as well, and the book was written initially. It was based upon the hypnosis session. So the people that they talked to or the extraterrestrials that they talked to that you say were humanoid-like, 
uh, possibly from Zeta Reticuli. Did they look like the particular grays that you would see in Hollywood with the giant wraparound eyes, or would they have smaller type eyes? Well, they there were two groups, the, the taller grays and the shorter grays, but they didn't look exactly like the description of the grays. If you if you go uh, to Amazon and you look up my book, Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, there is uh, one of these grays on the front cover. Uh, the only problem is the front cover shows black eyes. Betty and Barney remembered eyes that had a lot of black. There was a large black pupil, but they also saw some yellow in those eyes. So they were the large wraparound eyes, the larger head in proportion to the body than the human um, so they weren't that first description pretty much as I read the descriptive details is pretty much what we think of today as the grays. They had spindly arms and legs. They had barrel chests, larger chest portion for the arms and legs. Um, they walked Betty and Barney thought with a kind of a rolling gait. It wasn't a human kind of gait from their recollection. Uh, just a slit for a mouth. Uh, almost no nose, just a couple of holes and a tiny upturned uh, flared nostril, uh, holes for ears, completely hairless. Pretty much the same kind of description. Wow. That's quite fascinating. And then it obviously sparked your interest in UFO hunting. Have you ever been abducted or made contact? Betty and Barney, um, it, it was primarily Betty, but with Barney's cooperation, participated in a contact experiment. And I wrote about this and captured as well with a team of scientists. They were called psychophysics experiments. And she was scripted. And she was to try to send messages to these ETs to see if she could vector in a craft. The scientific team was actually looking for a piece of hardware. And so Betty began these experiments, and she uh, was trying to vector the craft in to land on my grandparents' farm. And one actually did. And it was seen coming in by one of our neighbors who was a commercial pilot. It woke my grandparents up that night. They saw it too. It left physical trace evidence on the ground. After that, I didn't see the craft that night. It woke my brother up when it sheared off to the top of some, some trees coming in because it made a loud noise. But I don't recall waking up. But I can tell you that I stood on the front porch of my parents' house. I uh, became very, very interested in astronomy. I had my telescope up there setting it up so that my father and I could have a night of sky watching. And there was a craft that came in, and it hovered right above my grandparents' barn. And it was close enough so that I could see the row of windows. And I, you can imagine my excitement. I was very excited about that, jumping up and down and yelling for my mother. She came out. She took one look at it, and she said, get into the house. <laughs> and that was it. Get away from the windows. Wow. So uh, that ended my night of sky watching <laughs> that <laughs> night. We weren't allowed to go out again. Um, and enough time, I was with Betty and uh, a group of family members and a family friend. And we did see a craft. There were uh, in the distance at first, then at treetop level, then hovering over the ice in the winter. Um, one of those crafts, uh, I can't say it actually shot a beam out at my mother. The, the beam sort of projected out slowly, and it was more like a hollow tube. She said, I didn't see it. I was looking in the opposite direction with the rest of the family members, and my mother was looking in that direction. It hit her, and then we all ran over, and uh, it receded, and we took off in the car um, and uh, went to the other side of the lake and then finally went home. But So those are occasions where I've seen craft. Uh, I've had a few sightings in my lifetime. Have you ever had any contact with the Department of Defense to try to, uh, to possibly get you or your family to do that type of experiment again? No. And it wasn't the Department of Defense that uh, had asked Bar Betty to do this experiment. It was a scientific team. The dress, wasn't there some type of obviously physical evidence, but was there a chemical or some type of trace element or something on there? Yes, there absolutely was. Um, 
Betty's dress was torn in several locations when she arrived home. It was could think of no acceptable prosaic explanation for how that occurred. There was even uh, a one inch tear in the thick zipper fabric and a two inch tear in the stitching on the zipper at the top of the back of her dress where the, they obviously didn't know how to undo a zipper because it was too far in their, <laughs> their past. So uh, they took the dress off her and just dropped it onto the floor and then put it back on her. She went home. She discovered the tears. She put the dress in her closet knowing that it needed to be repaired. The next time she took it out, it was coated with a pink powdery substance. She hung it on the clothesline. The pink powder blew away, but it had degraded the fiber in the fabric of her dress and stained her dress. And so in 1978, and don't tell me, uh, don't ask me why anyone was not interested in that dress until 1978. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of skepticism back that early. Uh, people thought in all of these UFO organizations, thought that, okay, well, maybe UFOs are real, but they certainly couldn't contain humanoids, and they <laughs> certainly couldn't be abducting people off the street. You know, so <laughs> we've come a long way uh, since then. But in 1978, Leonard Stringfield, who is one of the big names in early ufology, he was from Cincinnati, and he had the chemistry department at the University of Cincinnati do testing on her dress. And uh, all kinds, bleach, chlorine bleach, acid treatment, base treatments, ultraviolet light, a sun lamp for a day, all sorts of things to try to produce that effect. And uh, they weren't able to. They said that uh, the, the pink powder on the dress was, was pretty anomalous. I don't, I don't have their exact words in front of me, but uh, it was unusual is what, is what it was. Uh, it underwent chemical analysis a few times over the years. It's in the book, Captured. I talk about it when I speak as well. Um, but uh, Phyllis Budinger is the analytical chemist who did the most work on this dress. Uh, she worked for BP Amico, which was formerly Standard Oil, for 35 years as an analytical chemist. She has a master's degree in chemistry. And so she and Betty met, I believe it was in the year 2000, and discussed the dress. Phyllis took photographs of it at that time, took fabric samples from the dress, and started a very extensive analysis. And she concluded that the stained areas on Betty's dress were coated with a biological material of mostly protein and a small amount of natural oil protein had attacked the fiber and the dye and broke down the fiber structure, but it came from an external source, not from Betty. She also found a lot of bacteria on it from our natural environment, as if it had been you know, maybe on the ground or, or something. And so we wondered, could it have been when they dropped it onto the floor of the craft that that occurred? Um, but Phyllis's conclusion was that the chemical analyses support Betty's account of what happened during the abduction. So that was, that was very interesting. Then uh, there was also a, a seed assay growth test um, done by William C. Levengood from uh, Pinelandia Laboratory. He's now deceased. He, he died a few months ago. This was done in Michigan. And so what he did is he took samples from the dress, from the pink, from the blue, and, and he soaked them, cut them up and soaked them in water. And then he had these trays of seeds. And so he germinated the seeds. He watered some with the pink, some with the blue, some with regular water. And the ones that were watered with the pink d discolored fabric, soaked in water, uh, grew at an incredibly he said that it induced a high degree of energy in the water, which was a very anomalous finding, just almost unheard of, except for in other cases of abduction or where craft have sometimes landed. So, so that, that was all pretty interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, absolutely. That's fine. That brings me to the next thing. Obviously, you've had the opportunity to hear about many abduction cases, and I was wondering how many of those correlate with the Betty and Barney case. All of them, pretty much. 
things, uh, you know, the real ones. And I have to say that uh, this part of the perplexing part of this is that we know we have several different species who are taking people. But when it comes to the grays, what happens on that craft? Uh, are pretty, it's pretty much consistent with what happened with Betty and Barney. They do more now. They have, um, they have developed t- different technology, apparently, than they had then. Their technology can now uh, pass people through solid surfaces. Uh, and, you know, in the early days when they abducted people, it was a real abduction from an external environment. You might have been driving down the road. You might have been camping or fishing or hiking. And they would come and they would take you. But over time, they started to go to people's houses. And they started to take, if they took the parents, they took the children when they were young and have visited them over and over again throughout a lifetime. So many people who originally were considered abductees are now thinking of themselves as just experiencers or contactees. There's not that negative connotation as much as it used to be. Uh, So that's something that has changed Uh, something else that has changed is that um, the experiments are far more advanced than they certainly were when Betty and Barney were taken I said that they took sperm and they took probably ova from Betty Uh, that has something to do with the reproductive experiments I believe that they have continued to do now for the past 50 plus years And if you go take it back even further, you think of Antonio Villapoas in Brazil, who was forced to mate with what seemed like a hybrid being. So this may have been going on a lot, lot longer than we even realized. Some things that we know that Betty and Barney described in the very beginning, there are two groups of grays. One group appears to be the leaders, the educators, the physicians, the scientists. They're the ones who are conducting the experiments for the most part. The other group appears to be the guards, the assistants. They're the ones who might come and procure you from your house. They're the ones who uh, undress you, who take you to your room um, where you're going to undergo your examination and the experiments. And I can get into the experiments in a little while, but, that's, uh, they're the ones who make sure that you don't get off the craft with anything that belongs to them. And that's what they did with Betty way back in 1961, because she tried to get off that craft with a sort of a tablet. She called it a book, but it, when she described it, it was more what I think of as a tablet, and it had alien symbols inside it. And uh, they took it away from her. They would not let her get off the craft with it. They do the same thing today. The only thing is these little ones are not very intelligent, it seems, because they make mistakes. They dress people in the wrong clothing. You might wake up in bed in the morning dressed in somebody else's nightgown. Uh, You might wake up in bed with your head tucked in uh, to the foot of the bed and your feet on the pillow. All kinds of very strange mistakes that they make. And I wrote a lot about those in my latest book with Denise Stoner, The Alien Abduction File. That was released last May. And it has a lot of updated cases. You know, I had the opportunity to watch you talk a little bit about that. And I saw a moment of the hypnotic regressions that you did with her. And it was incredible. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that with us. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, Denise Stoner is a lifelong experiencer. Her mother uh, believes that she was taken when she was young. And the mother remembers that when Denise was a little girl, there was a craft that came in, uh, a very bright, bright light coming closer and closer to the family home at night while she and her husband were in the bedroom. And they're seated, sitting up on the bed. They're looking out at this, going to them, to saying, you know, is this an airplane? We're you know, is this going to crash into our house? We'd better keep watching this uh, because we might have to get the girls and get out of here. And all of a sudden, they're waking up the next morning. And the mother is a little traumatized. Something has happened 
to her. This runs in families. Some parents are taken, the children are taken. Denise believes that starting at age two and a half, uh, she was visited in her bedroom and taken to a craft, and that this has happened throughout her lifetime. She wasn't fully aware of this until 1982 when she had a classic old-fashioned abduction case just like Betty and Barney with her husband, her daughter. Uh, They're driving through uh, South Park Valley in Colorado, and all of a sudden, uh, they're coming down off from Kenosha Pass, 10,000-foot pass. They've stopped there. They're coming down uh, onto the valley floor, and they spot these new lights in the sky that are moving erratically. They're driving along. Ed checks his odometer. He checks the time. He'd, he'd been in the military, so he was very military-like at that time in the way he did things. Um, the craft come in very, very rapidly. They feel the car slide. Um, Denise wonders if they're having an accident. She looks at Ed, and he seems to be in a trance. He's staring straight ahead. His hands are on the steering wheel. And all of a sudden, the next thing they know, three hours have passed. It was 7 o'clock at night, a little before that. Now it's pitch dark outside. They're on the path of the other side of the valley. They've traveled 40 miles. It did not register on the odometer. They're freaking out. It's really, it's cold. They don't know what happened. No, meet Denise's parents at their campsite. They went there every Friday night during the summer. They drove on and arrived at the campsite. The parents are frantic. They're uh, walking up to the ranch house in order to call the highway patrol, wondering if their kids have been involved in an accident. Remember, no cell phones back then. And so uh, Denise and Ed drove in and explained what had happened. Uh, family didn't believe them. Uh, they, didn't, they were not aware of these UFO abductions at that time either. But they did become aware of that after that. And uh, this continued in, in Denise's life. She initially saw uh, Dr. Romack, who was a hypnotherapist in Denver, uh, outside Arvada, where she and Ed resided at that time. They now live in Florida near me. And uh, he did some hypnosis sessions initially with Denise about some experiences that she had uh, where she had memories, these lights coming into her bedroom, uh, sometimes in, during the daytime, sometimes at night, of, uh, of being taken time and time and time again, uh, of having fetuses removed, of receiving messages from the ET, from having that, um, that group that Betty and Barney described, the shorter guards, she liked to call them soldiers, and the taller ones. But there was another group now working with them, and those were the insectoids. And the insectoids were the examiners at this point. They were inserting implants into Denise. They were inserting needles into her navel. Uh, she received a tour of the central core of the craft. Uh, she's, I've written about in, in the book about her experiences, and she's written her personal accounts, too, of the different things that happened. And since that book was published, Denise has had another experience that I've been able to investigate firsthand, not as a historical case, but as a case that had just happened. And the thing that was, is so intriguing about this is, Denise was driving with me. We had gone down to uh, St. Peter, Petersburg, Florida, to a MUFON meeting that day. And my father was with us. We're on the way home uh, after the meeting, and things start to malfunction. My GPS system is malfunctioning. Denise's phone is malfunctioning. I never keep my cell phone turned on, but I had it with me. Um, but hers had completely discharged. It was fully charged, and then it completely discharged. Uh, what was going on here? Uh, she, we turned on my phone, and she called her husband and said, don't worry about me. I'll get home when I get home for some reason. Uh, we finally went, and we dropped Denise off. Uh, 
we live about 30 miles apart, so we, I dropped her off at a parking lot halfway between our houses. She got in the car. She's driving home, and her insulin pump discharges completely. Uh, it had a full battery. Suddenly it's dead. Uh, she said, you know, it's okay because she's on her way home. She'll be there in just a few minutes. And then she finds herself in a new location. No idea how she got there. She's no longer on the highway she's on. She's in a remote location on a lake. And she is remembering more and more consciously now than she ever had in the past. She remembers an orb coming up out of the lake. She has a vague memory of seeing her escort. This is the one who takes her over and over again. The next thing she remembers, she's in her driveway at her house. She does not have any memory of how she arrived at her driveway. She goes into the house. The dashboard, I should, forgot to say, the dashboard is malfunctioning at this point. The radio is not working. The side mirrors are not working. She's having some problems. She makes it, she realizes this when she arrives at home. She goes in and she's later than she should have been, quite significantly later. She calls me the next day and tells me something happened and what happened. And so she says, she's an investigator. I have to tell you, she's on MUFON's uh, abduction research team. When I met her, she was uh, MUFON's chief investigator in the state of Florida and a state section director. She's an experienced investigator herself. She had the equipment. She took her tri-field EM meter out to the vehicle and measured a high electromagnetic reading on the dashboard. I said to her, you have to get over here so I can see this, and we have to find out what happened. A few days later, she made it over, and we you know, tested the dashboard, and I set the meter down, her meter down on my kitchen table, and I was just fooling around with the switches. And when it was on an electrical reading, it was normal in the ambient environment. Didn't register hardly anything. With Denise, it registered 1,000 volts per meter from 10 feet away. I said to my husband, you have to get over here and see if you do this too. This has to be malfunctioning. Something is wrong here. He came over, normal reading. Human body goes up to about four. And uh, so then I said, oh, Denise, it's probably your insulin pump. It's probably something you're wearing. Take those things off. She took them off. It still registered 1,000 volts per meter from 10 feet away. Since then, I've found those high readings on the bodies of five different experiencers total. Uh, um, within a couple of days of the time they've had co a contact. Very, very interesting. It makes me wonder if this has something to do with the poltergeist activity that occurs and the electromagnetic effects that occur uh, immediately after an experience has taken place. I hear that over and over again. I did a research project with Denise a couple of years ago. We had 50 participants. We had a 25-person control group, 75 people in the study. Um, the, among the experiencers, a very, very high uh, percentage stated that uh, they had poltergeist activity. 88% said they had paranormal activity in their homes after an experience. The figures were incredibly high also on electromagnetic activity. Anomalies, light switches blowing out lights, appliances burning out one after another, computers malfunctioning. Um, even people clocked in on time clocks at work. I had one man who was a participant who, who told me that the, mal the time clock malfunctioned only for him after an experience, not for anyone else in the company, only for him and only after an experience. So uh, we're, wow. we're finding more and more evidence, and that's what I'm looking for is because, you know, debunkers can say, oh, it's all a figment of your imagination. There's no evidence to prove any of this. You're all fantasy prone. You all have sleep paralysis. You all have hypnagogic hallucinations. 
I'm collecting the evidence. That's what's important to me. You know, and another thing, too, that would be good to be able to prove to them is these implants that you speak of. Um, have you had access to different implants? Unfortunately, I have not. Uh, we in MUFON have referred people to the late Dr. Roger Lear, and unfortunately he has passed away. And uh, hopefully we're going to find someone else, another scientist, who can pick up and carry on with the work that he was doing with Steve Colburn, the material scientist who was working with him. Those implants had highly unusual properties. What exactly do you have as far as information goes with some of these implants? Have you been privy to some information that we might not have access to? I think that you can probably have access to all of that information. Steve Colburn wrote an article in Open Mind magazine about the research uh, that he and Roger Lear had been doing. And it's fascinating. Uh, I believe that they ended up removing 17 implants and all. But this article is on two different implants. And, you know, I'll just go over um, the, the early findings. And those that was that it was covered with some kind of a substance that caused the body not to reject it. So there was no immune response. Uh, it attached to nerve endings, very difficult to get out. It emitted a radio microwave frequency in, um, in the, the low megahertz range that uh, could transmit to deep space is what Roger Lear stated. Uh, Steve Colburn, has found out since then that it's nanotechnology that is far beyond our human capability, uh, crystalline structures in there. And you have to read his report if you can access it online at uh, Open Minds. Steve Colburn uh, is his name. I, I just did a Google search when I found it after I had uh, met Steve and Roger. I had known Roger for years before that. But uh, I was at a conference, and uh, they were speaking at that conference. So I attended their lecture and had the opportunity to speak to both of them and to, to read about that research that they were doing. Very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And you were talking about some people that you have learned about their experiences, and they don't really call themselves abductees, but experiences. And some of them have been given information. Um, was it like, is it a cautionary note of we need to change our ways or is it more towards some sign of hope or is it just, you know, hey, we're here, tell people about us and then they will accept us? Well, there are, there are many different messages they receive. And uh, going back years and years into the research, um, people have been told over and over again that they are very concerned about uh, our treatment of our planet, um, th that uh, they show individuals uh, images of tidal waves, of tsunamis, of volcanoes uh, erupting, uh, a lot of changes on the earth. Um, they have more recently been talking about uh, how they fear that uh, we, there could be an environmental disaster and that they are concerned about us on Earth. We know that they uh, have never liked their nuclear weapons. Um, they state that they are uh, doing these uh, experiments where they are growing hybrids. And, and, you know, sometimes I think that they're, they're humans, too. Uh, they're late-stage hybrids, um, and they're claiming that they have these uh, in case there is an environmental disaster um, that they will help out perhaps repopulate. I don't know, but that's some of the information that's coming to me um, over and over again. It's not coming from just one individual. And I, I never repeat anything that comes from only one individual. Uh, I don't know how it's being transmitted. If people are, if one individual is, talking to a hundred and therefore a hundred are stating it, or if it's a hundred different people who are um, independently giving this information, but they independently give it to me staying, saying that uh, they received it from extraterrestrial beings. So they're giving so, you this, 
information anonymously, at least your knowledge, from around the world saying basically the same thing? Yes, and I mean, I keep the information anonymous. I know a lot of these individuals. People trust me, and they know I would never violate confidentiality. So I receive a lot of information from from individuals. They stay in touch with me. And um, so that's that's about how I I receive that information. That's fascinating. And do they talk about them being in underground bases also? Well, some. Some people. But, you know, I've never talked to anyone who believes that they've been in an underground base. I know a lot of people state that, but maybe it's because I specialize in the friendly grays. (laughs) And, you know, people tend to go to people who specialize in the kind of experience they're having. How many... How many abduction cases have you done, Kathleen? I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, depends on what you mean by done. Well, as um, far as uh, cases that you've really uh, you've done actually hypnosis with, or you've been involved in personally. Okay, uh, in in cases that I've been involved in personally or done hypnosis with, it's well, probably about twenty or so. Not that many. But in terms of speaking face-to-face, over the phone, or in email messages, it's uh, with individuals. It's in the hundreds. Wow. And I don't, you know, I don't check off. I don't keep a checklist. A lot of people do. A lot of researchers want to say, I've spoken to 839 different people. I don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) I, I don't hypnotize many people. I have a strict policy about that uh, where I want evidence, physical evidence. I want to feel pretty confident that that person has actually had this kind of experience and that I'm not going to be helping someone to confabulate an experience or a fantasy based upon information that they've read elsewhere. So uh, that's why I don't do a lot of hypnosis. Yeah, it must be really hard for you to decipher all of these people calling you up, what's right, what's inaccurate. Have you found out that there's a percentage of people that are just calling to give false information to try and get in the limelight? Yes, absolutely. I've, um, I'm thinking of three, three cases that I personally have investigated. Uh, they were all men. They all had fantastic stories. Uh, and I caught every one of them hoaxing. Good for so, you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and that does happen. I've, I've had training in uh, FBI training in how to see signs of deception based upon f- body language. Okay. And, and I also, uh, I investigate the person, not just the experience. I investigate the person. That's a really good thing. There needs to be more of that. So that way, the people that are the disbelievers and the skeptics, you can say, look, you know, I've, I've done the exact same research that a private investigator or a detective would do on their case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's yeah. awesome. And some of the cases that you've researched and some of the people that you've talked to, um, you say that there's actually different species. Some of them look over the other ones, um, some that are insectoid type as well. When you describe the different experiences that people go through and the different levels of advancement that they've gone uh, through the years, could you describe some that really stand out to you? Uh, in terms of the ET types, you mean? Well, yes, the ET types and the actual experiences, the abductions, what they were like. You say they became more advanced over the years. Before, it was just basically a flying saucer that would fly over the house, pull somebody in. But the the techniques that they use now, you said, are different. I, I think I got that right, didn't I? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. You know, there's, uh, they seem to use technology to take people through a solid surface. Um, that is uh, a sound principle based upon physics. If uh, you think of everything vibrates at a certain frequency. So uh, a rock will vibrate at a lower frequency than a human body. And I'm not talking about new age here. I'm talking about physics, theoretical physics. Um, And I say that because some people uh, are saying I'm getting into the woo-woo aspects of all of this. I'm talking to physicists about this. And the way theoretically that this can be done to pass a human body through a solid surface is that we have to remember that 99.9% of the atom is empty space between the protons and the electrons. So if we can match up 
frequency, the human frequency, the frequency of that wall and the frequency of the, of the ET's body uh, and phase so that all of those atoms are lined up, then we can pass matter through matter. And we've actually done this on a very small scale in a laboratory, I mean, minuscule, compared to what people are reporting. And, you know, it is just amazing. There's been a lot of discussion. Are ETs interdimensional? Are they only taking the human's consciousness? Are they taking the human soul out of the body and taking it onto the craft? And an, an, something that I have to answer, I feel compelled to find the answer to that. And I'm going, if it's, if it's only the soul, how come people are coming back uh, traumatized sometimes for a couple of days, and with marks on their bodies? How come some people have sunburns without exposure to the sun? How come they have these strange triangular marks on their body? How come some people have evidence of having had surgery? The scar is there. Um, there's a hole where it appears something has been removed, if it's only the consciousness that's being taken. And then I recently became aware of a case that has been under investigation by MUFON for uh, about eight or nine years now, where there was actually damage done to the ceiling when the ET's technology fouled up and this person uh, passed through partially and then got stuck and they had to redo all of this. And there, there was actually a dent in that person's ceiling. That's pretty amazing. So it leads me to believe that there is technology that is being used here by these grades, whom wow. I to have told that prefer to be called Zetas. Some people tell me that. <laughs> okay. I've heard a lot of people say that, Dr. I Gordon. try to be um, respectful. Yeah. And what's your take on Nancy Leader? She talks about being able to channel the Zetas and make contact with them. You know, a lot of people claim to be able to channel the Zetas. And uh, I've never put a lot of stock in channeling, but what I'm trying to do now is I'm not familiar with her, what she's channeled, but I've been working with a man in Australia who uh, is channeling information from the ETs. And I've actually been able to have an interview. Uh, now, you know, I say, I don't know if any of this is real. Give me some evidence. How can I know if this is real? And one of the women, actually, that I had uh, written about in my book had a healing by these ETs. So I had had a physical condition that had gone on for many, many years. And I said to him, Zeta, well, do you think you could heal me? And so uh, he said, well, you know, we'll see what we can do with something like that. And three days later, I woke up and my whole body was vibrating. It was like electrical shocks were passing through my body. I'd never had this experience before. It's, it was, it, and it was just coursing through my body over and over and over again. Experiencers talk about this on the craft that it's being done sort of as a healing session for them. And um, then I had excruciating pain in some parts of my body. And I, I was wide awake. This was not a dream. Um, I was really kind of panicking, wondering if I was dying. And then I remembered and thought, well, maybe I'm being healed. Wouldn't this be extraordinary? I'll lie back here and not get up and call the ambulance or anything and see what happens. And I was healed. Wow. That's so, amazing. Um, my doctor has that on record. And uh, it is truly, truly amazing to me uh, that gave me an indication that, you know, what this medium was saying is, seems to be real. I don't think it was only a coincidence. And I'm certain it wasn't sleep paralysis. And it also sounds like some type of frequency that was used to possibly heal you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Kat. It is the most amazing <laughs> thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. So I, you know, from that got the message that these greys are not doing any harm to us. They seem benevolent. And this is from the same guy that is in Australia? Yes. Okay. He has the grey who, who speaks through him, the Zeta. Um, Keek is the Zeta, what he calls the Zeta. 
who is also giving information to a scientist in Canada. And the information being get, given far above the educational level of this man in Australia. And uh, he's, it's checking out, according to the scientist. He's very interested in it as well. Could you share some of the information that he's given you from the Zetas that he claims to have channeled? Oh, um, yes, because I've spoken directly. I've been able to ask questions. And uh, one of the questions, well, my background is in social, sociology, social science, okay. social work. So I'm very interested in the family structure and the way that people live and, and that sort of thing. So I have asked uh, about their planet, and they say he said that it's a, a planet in the Zeta star system. Uh, he said that their planet had an environmental disaster. Many, many years ago, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands or what, but a long, long time ago. That's the only message I got. And that they live underground, those who survive underground in tunnels. Uh, and, but they can now go above the surface, he said, uh, for a certain period of time every day. Um, they do have families. There are women and children, but they don't reproduce the way uh, we do. They reproduce the way that they're growing um, babies on these crafts. He denies the hybrid thing. Uh, he said, I think he, he did say that some groups of renegade greys are doing hybrid experiments. But he also said that um, their experiments have ended his group by experiments and they're only helping humans at this point. Well, and there's also other species that are talked about. And one of the really big ones now that's all over the internet, especially since David Icke started talking about them was the reptilians. Um, have you been any, have you gotten any information on that by your contacts or has that in your eyes been debunked? Um, in terms of the reptilians, no, not very much at all. I have one case in my book uh, where a rep, uh, the, the experiencer stated that uh, what she described as a reptilian came into her room. I don't know if it was a reptilian or if it was a negative entity. Whatever it was, uh, was really pretty horrifying. But then the grays came through after that. So I don't know. I'm not clear what that was all about. She's not clear what that was all about. Um, and to tell you the truth, researchers that I know of and that I have read about who started investigating these reptilian abductions ended up being taken by the reptilians. And I don't want to have anything to do with entities that might have a negative agenda. I stay away from the reptilians entirely. Um, I, I've read about them. I've read about them on the Internet. I've even met people who claim to be reptilians or reptilian hybrids uh, at conferences. I've spoken with uh, a man who claims that uh, reptilians have taken him and his son and his daughter and his niece, that they have raped his young daughter and his niece, that they have put him and his son in training uh, to be warriors, um, you know, you hear these stories, and really that's not what I'm about. That's not what my personality is about. I'm a, a positive person, and I, I would no more want to get involved in the investigation and study of that than I would want to get involved in the investigation and exorcism of demons. Let me put it that way. And. Have you ever came to the conclusion that some of these people that have called you or that you've researched uh, have actually been looking at military craft and not extraterrestrial stuff? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, especially now uh, with the dro drones, uh, the technological advancements that we have made uh, as a country, that, yes, certainly some people mistake craft. I mean, uh, only about 20% of the sightings end up being uh, 
unknowns, true unknowns. I say 20% because I'm going on government the statistics in federal government studies. Uh, and I'm also going on the statistics that I receive every month from the Mutual UFO Network on close encounters. Now, if something is 100 feet away from a person or even 500 feet away from a person, I think that they are able to tell the difference between uh, that and a military craft. Um, you know, there's this difference there. Um, and it's, it's around 20%. Uh, some people say 3%. But the rest, the other 80%, generally have prosaic explanations. And one of those explanations is our own uh, aircraft, an experimental aircraft. So, you know, it could be a part of it. So, and also in a lot of different countries, you'll see more UFO sightings. The news is more open about it. Do you feel that disclosure will ever actually take place or it's just going to continue to be something that's talked about in alternative media? (laughs) Well, I think it's being disclosed all over the place. Uh, by people like me and people in our field and um, with Steve Bassard having the disclosure hearings in in Washington, Um, politicians who you could see over a five-day period uh, went from being skeptics to actually taking this seriously. I think the word is spreading. But in terms of the president of the United States or a leading member of the scientific community standing up and saying – the, the Earth is being visited by these extraterrestrial beings. Um, they have been taking our citizens uh, on board their craft, uh, sometimes for reproductive experiments, sometimes for things that aren't so good. And uh, they're here. There's nothing we can do about it, folks. I don't think they're going to say that. I think that they fear there will be too much panic among people, that there will be rioting that the criminals will uh, start taking advantage of the situation and engage in criminal activity. I think they, uh, there might be a backlash against experiencers. Uh, there are all sorts of things that, that could take place. So uh, I think that if there's a disclosure, it's going to be made by the ETs themselves. Well, and if you've seen the movie, or I should say the TV show, the series Taken by Steven Spielberg, there is a underlying theme of the people that get abducted. They're in the family, you know, father, son, et cetera. The people that you've talked to, the research that you've done, have you found that there's an underlying theme like the particular blood type of the individuals or something else? That was one of the questions we asked on our research project. Other researchers have stated that there's an elevated level of RH negative blood, um, and we did find an elevated level as well, but we also found um, that many experiences had O positive blood, which is the the most common type of blood. So, uh, you know, even though there's that elevated RH negative factor, uh, it it appears to cross uh, across um, lines, family lines, um, cultural lines, race lines. Um, so maybe it, it, all that all dates back, that envelop, uh, increased level of RH negative and A or B might go back to the origin of those individuals um, if, if, in fact, they've been taken for thousands of years. And I don't know. I haven't, I haven't made up my mind about that. I'm, I'm pretty slow in making up my mind about things. I throw out a lot of information, but uh, I'm sure about very few things. Good for you. I, I definitely respect that, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Uh, you're definitely doing the trial by elimination with the, the data you're putting together, it sounds like. Yes, I definitely am. Well, you know, and that brings me to another thing, too. With the famous men in black and the government seems to keep a lot of things under wraps with Area 51, have there been any attempts to try and persuade your research, or have you ever had any threats or anything like that by uncovering stuff? Not direct threats. Um, there, there are people who are not happy about what I'm doing, um, who have uh, made verbal attacks upon me. Um, I did have, uh, when the new book was written, 
I have to say that Denise had a um, security clearance with the military. She worked for the Navy. And we had some problems with some of our radio shows with a lot of static and uh, finally just being cut off. And I said to Denise, you know, this is happening. I, I was recording this because I, in the beginning, I thought, oh, it's paranoia to think this is happening. It's just it's something else. Um, but then it happened so often. I began to wonder if maybe it wasn't just paranoia. And so um, in the end, I said to Denise, maybe when we introduce you, better not mention that military part. Maybe the military finds it embarrassing that one of their own uh, who had a clearance is now saying this. Started uh, not disclosing that part about herself. And she didn't have any more problems. So as far as the research that you've been doing lately, are there some particular hot spots out there where there's more abduction cases or more sightings? Oh, well, the state of Florida is a hot spot for sightings. Also, uh, California, uh, you know, particularly, I think, because the weather is so nice and so many people are outside nights. And if you're outside, you're looking up into the sky, you're going to see things. Um, in terms of uh, contact experiences, people are reporting from all over the place, all over. And in Brazil, I read back, I think it was 20, 25 years ago, there was some type of activity where they, people were actually being attacked for over a week. Are you familiar with that? I've read about that. I haven't spoken to the individuals who actually researched that, but it was, you know, villagers and, uh, some were actually being killed and, and one came actually came into contact, physical contact with ETs. I think there was a military a man or two involved in it too, who ended up dying. And I've heard of another case where um, this was canines on uh, an Apache reservation uh, out West. Uh, these, there was an old man. And I, I actually spoke to the um, police officers on the reservation. Uh, and there was an old man who lived out in a remote area, no electricity, no running water. And he had a, a bunch of dogs who were outside at night. And the dogs were barking and carrying on. So he's peeking out the window um, at the dogs to see what they're barking at. And here is this craft that has landed and there are these non-human entities that are walking up by the dogs. And the dogs are going after them. And all of a sudden, the dogs are stopped in their tracks. And um, the man, they didn't go beyond that. Uh, all of a sudden, the craft and the entities are gone. I don't know if they took the old man and visited with him or not. But um, the dogs died, unfortunately, within a few days. So sometimes that does happen. Okay. It didn't happen to my aunt and uncle's dog, to Delphi. Um, she only developed a fungal infection on her skin. You know, there's been a lot of speculation, too. I don't know if you found much information on this, that some of these people that have been implanted with particular devices, uh, you know, that emit these EMFs, are, you know, causes cancer, some type of tumors or problems with their bodies. Yeah, well, we know that uh, EM frequencies can cause tumor growth and, and malignant tumors to grow. If you, if you read any of the studies that have been done on that, we have, <laughs> but the United States has a very high uh, electromagnetic uh, frequency uh, field. Now there's a book called the body electric written by Robert O. Beck Becker um, and a doctor. I have the book here. Stanton Friedman was actually the one who recommended it. He uh, had read the book for his research, when we wrote the book together, science was wrong. And uh, it's on experiments that he has done using magnetism and electromagnetic fields. Um, and, and we know it's not good for you, but we know also that, that Dr. Becker found that it would increase healing in experiments that he did too. But uh, it was never accepted because more money was being made um, by uh, the drug companies and, and through that type of traditional medical treatment. Um, but 
Yes, I, I can tell you, my aunt, Betty Hill. Now, she never thought she had an implant. She never thought that she had been abducted more than one time. But she had uh, three different types of unrelated cancers uh, and that brain tumor as well. So it does make you wonder. But she was also a heavy smoker. So, you know, on one side, it's like, is there a prosaic explanation? On the other side, uh, is was she carrying around uh, uh, an implant? We'll never know because her daughter would not permit uh, an autopsy to be done on her body. And having the opportunity to work with MUFON, are there particular files that you don't release to the public? Uh, in MUFON, yes. We have many, many confidential files, uh, many reports that are never released to the public. You know, we receive somewhere between 600 and 800 reports a month. These are of um, both sightings and abductions. Those cases have to be investigated. There's no way we could report all of those cases. And some people who make reports simply would prefer not to have their information put out because they fear even with anonymity, that there might be uh, a violation of confidentiality. So I'm, I'm very respectful toward people, considering what happened in my own family with a violation of confidentiality. I would never, ever want to hurt anyone. And does MUFON report to Robert Bigelow from Bigelow Aerospace or have any dealings with him? No, MUFON does not. There was a time when James Carrion was MUFON's international director. And Bigelow had made a proposal that he would fund investigations. Um, and he set down uh, certain requirements. I don't even know what those requirements were. I know that there's a lot of conspiracy theory about that. And some people even think that uh, MUFON is owned by Bigelow or MUFON is owned by the federal government. That is not true. Um, MUFON completely separated from Bigelow, severed all ties with him. And uh, unfortunately, we no longer have any funding. Uh, so that's the difficult thing because our funding comes from donations made by our members and from our membership fees and from our conferences. It's, it's that sort of thing. So we, we don't have a big time money backer. We do the best we can with the equipment that we own. Our investigators purchase their own equipment. They're doing all of this on a volunteer basis uh, as individuals in, with, in state chapters. Now, did he actually pull away, or what happened with that relationship? Uh, MUFON would not uh, agree to his demands, and therefore ties were severed. He said, you know, if you, won't, if you, don't, if you will not do what I ask, and give me this information, then I'm not giving you the funding. And MUFON would not do what he asked. Okay. Okay. And so basically right now you don't have a big supporter like that. Maybe you could get a hold of uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to have a big supporter, but we cannot, we cannot violate confidentiality regardless of how much money that person has. That's okay. the thing. That's don't great. ask us to violate confidentiality because we simply will not do that. Well, that's very honorable indeed. Well, could, can I ask exactly what info he was after? I really don't know because I was not on the board at the time. I didn't have uh, the, the position I have. I had left my position as the director of field investigator training, and I was pretty much doing research and writing on my own and not even doing investigations for MUFON during the time when there was that big problem. I know that a lot of MUFON members uh, left MUFON at that time, too. But now we have a really great new director, Jan Harzan, who uh, is, uh, has a, is the same kind of uh, mind that, that I am in terms of not harming anyone, of bringing people together, of making this very professional. And people are beginning to join MUFON again, people who had been away from us for a few years. So I'm very, very proud of what we're doing right now. It would be nice to have more funding to do this important research, particularly uh, some of the medical tests that experiencers have agreed to take part in, uh, but don't have the money to take part in. 
Have you ever thought about maybe putting some type of surveillance cameras into the houses or rooms of people that get abducted on a continual basis so that way when it does happen, maybe it would pick it up? We've already done that. And uh, we already have the tapes. Denise Stoner took part in one of those experiments several years ago uh, where uh, cameras were put into her home, cameras that were impossible to tamper with. There was a dedicated phone line put in there. And when there was activity, they came and they collected it. But then it was another funding issue. Um, and we've recently come up with some money so that uh, one of those tapes is being analyzed right now. But they have thousands of hours of footage, and it costs money to pay people. I suppose that we must not have the volunteers who are willing to do that confidentially. Um, you know, so... Also, when I work with experiences, I always encourage them, if they can afford to, to put cameras in their homes, um, motion-activated, infrared cameras, at whatever level they can afford. Um, even game, infrared game cameras. Uh, and, and I do have to tell you that anyone who knows a lot about this is going to say the cameras are going to shut down because the ETs won't permit themselves to be photographed. Yes, they do shut down. I can tell you they do. But I, it's what I do see that I consider uh, important. And let me tell you about one case. Uh, it's a man and a wife being taken. They have, they're in bed. They're both awake. You can see this on the camera. Um, one of them has seen an ET through the bedroom window. There's light coming into the house. They are seated. They're back to back. Uh, he's looking at the door. She's looking at the window. All of a sudden, it's two hours and something like uh, 11 minutes later, and they're in bed sleeping. They're, they're lying down. Uh, the camera did not pick up any of that movement you know, of maybe them lying down again, settling in, rolling over, everything that people do during the night for that time period. All you see is them anticipating that an, ex an abduction is going to take place. And I say abduction in that case because they're frightened people. They consider it to be an abduction. So it's what I'm seeing there that I find interesting. Is it proof? No, it's not proof. But the mo you, you take that along with conscious recall and the marks on their body. And, uh, you know, then maybe you have something. Maybe you can look for implants. But we need the money in, and the people in order to do that. And, you know, this is not a field where uh, a lot of people are willing to fund research. It's, you know, it's a political no-no. It's not politically correct. So sure. you know, that presents a problem. But uh, also, I've, I have put one of those cameras in my own bedroom after what happened with that healing. <laughs> um, and I'm also, that's for one reason. Another reason is that I wanted to, to observe my own sleep patterns, my husband's sleep patterns. I wanted to see if we, uh, if that happens on my own camera where we might be uh, sitting up and then suddenly it's two hours later and uh, the, no, there's been no movement. And I can say, no, that has not happened to us. Have you ever thought about possibly doing that experiment again where you were able to draw in that craft and you could see the line of windows? Um, well, I didn't try to draw in that craft when I was a teenager. Um, but you were involved. It was coming. I was involved in it because it was Betty. I can tell you that I did an experiment once. And this was, oh, a year or so ago, maybe more than that. And I thought for a week, okay, I'm going to try this just to see if it works. And I looked out my window one night when I was doing this, and there in the clouds was this fluorescent green um, triangle. And, I was, and it was flashing. And I thought, well, is it thunder? I'd never seen thunder that color, but maybe that's what it is. Or maybe there are fireworks. Maybe there's a fireworks display in one of the nearby towns. So I'd have to check into that. And then the next day, I found out that two other people reported observing a UFO 
in the next town over at the same time that I saw that craft behind the clouds. So I don't know. Did it work or was it just a coincidence? Was I seeing fireworks? I don't, well, I couldn't find uh, any fireworks events in the newspapers taking place that night or when I checked online. So, you know, a mystery. I don't have the answer for that, but if I was able to do that or not. Some people claim they can. Yeah, I have seen articles, uh, videos, but I've never seen somebody do it in person. Um, So that would be an incredible feat for sure. Yes, Stephen Greer claims to do that on a fairly regular basis. He, but he charges people a lot of money to go uh, and do that with him. Sure. So do you have any video archives, or does MUFON have any archives of any type of evidence of floating people, maybe aliens, craft, or anything that would be considered unexplainable? Uh, yes, MUFON has evidence of craft. I have photographs that Betty took of uh, what I consider to be unexplainable. One uh, shows the a disc with a window with what appears to be uh, something standing in that window. I also have a photograph she took of a, a fiery orb that has kind of a white uh, thing stuck into it. Uh, so, and I've received other photographs. There are some fairly clear photographs. A lot of them are not very clear. Um, MUFON has uh, uh, a television show on now. Um, I think it's on Friday evenings, but it might repeat during the week. Uh, and it's specifically devoted to MUFON's files. So, and, and I'm surprised we have a lot of files that I wasn't even aware of. And yeah. I've been a member of the organization since 1991. <laughs> you know, and I think I heard you talking earlier on a YouTube video about how under a particular hypnosis regression, I don't remember the name of the gal, but she was talking about the craft and it was almost connected biology and technology together and she had to actually think to be a part of it or the pilot had to mentally control it. It was connected body, mind, etc. Uh, yes, and in fact, that was Denise that I had hypnotized. And this is when the insectoid being had taken her into uh, the central core of the craft. And she thought that it was probably because her father worked in aerospace and, and, and she was interested in that. And uh, she, this might uh, have a biological component that it could think. Now, I don't know... You know, I've discussed this with people. I've had reports from several other experiencers that came to me independently before I published this in the alien abduction file and started to speak about it, all of them stating that they felt that uh, it had a biological component. Others have said to me that maybe it is uh, just uh, artificial intelligence and not biological so, I mean, that's another mystery, too. If it's biological, how does it sustain life? Um, that's one of my questions. But it definitely does seem to have intelligence. Uh, she was told that all of the craft know where the other ones are all at the same time, that it seems to have sort of a collective consciousness. And I received this channeled information independently, too, through Keek uh, from the, the man in Australia, um, who had no idea what Denise said, and she had no idea what he said. Um, so that was very interesting. But when Denise inside that part of the craft, it seemed like she was being struck by for, a force field. And you know what a person might look like if they were being struck by bean bags that were being thrown at them, and their limbs would sort of move out or rash away? That's what Denise was experiencing while she was under hypnosis. Very, very strange to, to see. Um, very strange. So she was almost having like uh, seizures or something a little bit when she was under hypnosis explaining this. Well, I can't know. It wasn't a seizure because it wasn't moving the way that I've seen people with epilepsy have seizures. It was like she would have one bean bag thrown at the upper arm, then one bean bag thrown at a lower arm, 
uh, another part of her body. So it was like she was being hit at different times by these different by these the sports field. Like a fell safe kind of some something not wanting her to say what happened, I guess. Well, not to say what happened, but uh, something that was being emitted by that central core, she thought. And she oh. had to get out of that room. She thought it was part of the technology, not as a warning to her. Okay. Not to so, say anything. So, and you said that she actually got to walk the craft. So did she explain what it looked like? Oh, yes. Could yes. you get into detail on some of that? Well, um, on the inside of the craft, uh, when she went in, it's a, a dimly lit hallway. Uh, the little soldiers uh, lined up against the wall, almost blending into the wall, um, not moving unless they're instructed to. Um, she is taken down this corridor. There's a, a room on the left. There's uh, an entity standing by the room. And at that point, uh, I had to take her out of hypnosis uh, because she did not want to go beyond that moment. Um, this was the insectoid whose appearance she found terribly frightening. Uh, we talked together, worked together for about a month. She was ready to go back into hypnosis and was ready to face this person. She's taken into a dimly lighted um, small room, no corners, uh, domed ceiling, put on a table. The uh, escort stands by her head. The, there are guards in the room, and the insectoid is the physician. Uh, he thrusts a needle into her navel, just low, unbuttons her jeans and lowers them a little bit. Apparently was able to operate a zipper at that point after 20 years or more. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, probably inserted an implant. He produced a, a long wire. He uh, put that wire through her foot and up her leg. He told her that it was a new kind of tracking device, um, that it would stay with her and would make it easier for them to communicate with her. Um, whenever she'd experience pain, her escort, who was up by her head, would uh, do the same kind of thing that they did with Betty Hill back in 1961, and the pain would go away. And I don't want to get into a whole lot of detailed information. I'm giving you general information, because part of the way that I know if somebody has had a real experience is in the details that they give me. So I and other researchers, a few of us, know a lot of detailed information that we simply don't disclose. Well, I can certainly respect that, um, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. It'd be nice to get that information. Um, but once again, you know, it's a catch-22 thing there. So what, what do you need to keep for yourself to keep things genuine and real? I can respect that. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the characteristics of this insectoid type creature, there's a lot of people that talk about mantis type aliens. I've had several guests on recently that have even talked about mantis type aliens that are giant insectoid creatures. Is that the, the same species, do you feel? Was it described as a mantis type yes. insectoid? Yes, the, the description is exactly the same. Exactly the same as what Tom Reed, for example, describes uh, from the time that he was a young child. Um, two of the individuals in my book have described the same being. Uh, it's, it's the mantis type. You hear uh, chirping as well in, in their craft. I don't know how I would react if a nine-foot-tall mantis creature was chirping at me. I guess I'd have to communicate telepathically. <laughs> yeah, I've, I have never received a report of them being over seven feet tall. Generally, okay. they're described as being six or seven. They're so much taller than the grays, though, that their legs sort of fold up, according to Tom Reed, and they can make themselves shorter. They can make themselves shorter. And have you ever talked to anybody that said they could actually, these beings can shape shift? Well, yes. <laughs> I have okay. well, for a very long period of time. We have known that uh, these beings um, 
they say in order to uh, protect humans from, from being so frightened uh, appear uh, as a herd of deer in a road or as a three-foot-tall owl that stops a car and then walks over to the driver's side or uh, you know, any number of animals, but those are two of the most common ones. Um, so you might call that shape-shifting. I don't know if it's shape-shifting or if they are simply inserting uh, that information into the human's mind. And so it's a matter of the human perception it, through an altered state of consciousness through mind control. Um, also, you know, when I'm studying this, I have to study other things, too, uh, I've discovered. So I'm, I've been discover, studying um, interdimensional entities. I've been studying spirit activity and that kind of thing to see what the overlap is, if there's any overlap. And oftentimes, these low vibrational spirit entities that are reported um, in other places, and I don't have a lot of firsthand knowledge about this at all, but they are said to be shapeshifters as well. Well, and you so, talked earlier about how after people had experiences, then a lot of paranormal activity would take place typically. Yes. Yeah. And I've also heard people say that they feel... Um, that um, ghosts and extraterrestrials in some cases are almost from the same energy source. Uh, that's the feeling they got as being empathetic and I guess you could say psychic. What has your experiences and information and research led you to in, the, in that regard? Well, I've heard that many, many times. And so I'm very carefully and cautiously trying to study that. And where I am right now, and I could be totally wrong, is, if these ETs are using technology to enter a person's house, then perhaps that technology opens up a dimension and or other dimension. And perhaps these interdimensional beings, the spirit activity, whatever, is coming in and remaining in a person's house. That's one possibility. Another possibility might be uh, what happens when the human body uh, is dematerialized and then rematerialized. We know that experiencers and near-death experiencers have very similar characteristics. Um, and so uh, in psychological testing that has been done. So we're wondering, does the human soul actually separate from the body? And then is it reconstructed when the human's body is reassembled? Could that be what it is? Or could it be being in an ET environment, in that electromagnetic environment that's causing a high electrical field in the human body? And is that a high electrical or electromagnetic field that causes these other anomalies also causing the poltergeist activity? A lot of questions there, and I don't have a lot of answers. I only have speculation, as you know, I have on most of the things that I've said tonight. Nobody knows all of the answers to this. Some people think they do, but uh, they're not being very scientific, I don't think, if they, if they think they have all the answers. Right. Uh, I guess the only way you're going to get that information is if you can get it from one of these interdimensional beings and they don't give you the amnesia switch afterwards. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> um, but I am going to be working with a team of scientists and researchers um, and maybe we can come up with some legitimate theories when we put all of our heads together. A absolutely it is. Absolutely. And are there people that have these cases uh, that you feel are genuine from, the, you know, from talking to them, et cetera? Do they claim to have shadow people as well that follow them around in many cases? I find more shadow people in the possible interdimensional entities. That's um, my observation based upon anecdotal reports that have come to me. Okay. And do they offer them certain type of powers or, you know, certain benefits for the, you know, for having to go through the abductions and stuff like that, or just being a part of what they're doing? Well, in terms of benefits, I know that the ETs have uh, healed individuals, um, diseases of cancer, I've had my own healing. So, um, and I've spoken with Barbara Lamb, who is a, a longtime researcher um, and psychotherapist uh, who has hypnotized many, many experiences. 
And uh, she has told me that she has evidence of several of the people she's worked with who have been cured of what would have been fatal diseases. Wow. Yeah, actually, we're going to have the opportunity to speak with Barbara here. Yeah. So you can ask her about that. Absolutely. Well, you know, and I guess we, we don't have a whole lot of time left here, but if there's maybe some information that you haven't shared with us yet that you feel is important as far as what you've put together, the dots and the pieces that you've connected, what is the overall agenda of these extraterrestrials, of our space brothers? I think there are many agendas, depending upon whether that entity is benevolent or uh, just not so kind. You know, when you think about the reptilians, they certainly have a, have a different agenda than uh, the uh, almost angelic type of beings, the Nordics, who are contacting some people. So uh, a number of different agendas. Okay. Some take more than others. Are you familiar with Whitley Schreiber and his abductions? Yes, I've read his book. I've been on his radio show a couple of times. Um, if you could do us a favor and let us know your website so that if anybody wants to check out your books that you have. Yes, I'd love to. And it also lists my speaking engagements this year and has articles I've written. It's uh, very easy. Kathleen with a K, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N dash Martin, M-A-R-D-E-N dot com. Okay. Well, fantastic. Uh, this has been great. Appreciate you coming out. Uh, hopefully we can get you on here again sometime. That's my pleasure. You take care. A very special thank you to our guest tonight. For all of you that had the opportunity to be here with us, if you enjoyed the show, follow us on YouTube, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord, for the most recent interviews, videos, and podcasts. Or you can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.leakproject.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? If you have information that the world needs to see and hear, send us an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com. Dot com. Thank you, everybody. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. Good night. <laughs>
uh, in MUFON and building that component uh, because it was very, very weak when I took over. But it's so important. And in addition to that, I do a lot of writing. I have a lot of articles on my website. So, um, I'm starting work on a new book, and uh, I just stay really, really very busy you know, tracking down ETs and uh, trying to find out what they're up to. Wow. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's about the coolest job you can have as far as being a UFO hunter. With these experiences that you have had the opportunity to hear about, your aunt and uncle was Betty and Barney Hill. Is that correct? That is correct, and I was 13 years old when they had their experience. Betty was my mother's older sister, and I heard about their close encounter on the day they arrived home from their trip on September 20th, 1961, and I've been following it ever since. Jeez. When you saw them, what were their expressions like? Well, I can tell you two days after this occurred, we were down at their house, my parents my two brothers and I drove down and heard the story firsthand, and uh, their reactions were different. Betty was very, very curious. She was a lot like me, and she wanted to get the answers. She knew almost nothing about this subject. She had never read a book on it, regardless of what the debunkers say. They're always saying, oh, she was a science fiction fan. She was a, a UFO uh, enthusiast all of her life. That's complete nonsense. Uh, she was not. Uh, in, and Barney was a complete skeptic before this happened. So uh, Betty was uh, looking for the evidence, testing the evidence, and Barney was more reticent. He, he, was, he found this far more distressing. And I think the reason for that is that he is the one who had conscious, continuous recall of observing non-human entities looking down at him. They were humanoid in form, but not human. And those were in his earliest statements to investigators. So this distressed him greatly because he feared that he was going to be captured like a bug in a net, he said to Walter Webb, who was the first investigator who interviewed him on September 20, uh, October 21st, 1961. Jeez, a bug in a net. Yes, yes. He, uh, he, was, he feared for his life. You know, that sounds so hopeless. Saying something like that just goes to show you the helplessness that somebody like that uh, must feel when they get uh, abducted in any case. Wow. Yes, and you know what happens to bugs when they're caught in nets for entomology classes. There's a pin that goes through them, and they're put up on a board. So, you know, I'm sure he feared for his life. Geez, yeah, absolutely. Did he describe them to you more than uh, just the humanoid figures as far as uh, the... The initial report, and uh, he sat and talked quietly with my father on that day. Uh, but in the initial report, he stated that they were dressed in black, shiny uniforms, that they moved with military precision, that one stayed at the window and stared down at him, and he found that being to, to be very threatening in appearance because it, he got the idea from him that uh, the plan was to capture him. Uh, the others turned to a panel on the back wall, and he could see them from about their knees all the way up to the tops of their heads through binoculars. And uh, in shiny black uniforms, he thought that, uh, you know, they were probably some type of extraterrestrial military group. Well, and you've heard a lot of speculation that the military actually works with uh, different extraterrestrial races. So did he see military personnel also? No, Barney did not see humans on that craft. And let me say something, because in his first hypnosis session, with Dr. Benjamin Simon in 1963, this was February of 1963, when he had a powerful ab reaction, he started to remember an experience where he was that frightened in the past. Dr. Simon was doing hypnoanalysis with Barney, and he instructed him 
to compare everything he stated, all of his emotional feelings, to something that happened to him in the past. So this comparison was of a time in the past when Barney uh, saw a Nazi officer. Barney served in the Army during World War II. He was a truck driver. He was wounded in an explosion. He was released uh, after two years in fair condition from the wounds he received. So it was that experience standing in that field in Lincoln, New Hampshire in 1961 that reminded him of the fear he he experienced uh, when he viewed a Nazi officer. And that was the comparison. Never again in the hypnosis or in Barney's conscious memory did he ever mention human being. And people get this confused, not only that Nazi statement, but also people think that humanoid means human, and it does not. It only means there's a head, there are two arms, there are two legs, and there's a torso. Okay, so... It could be from a different time, a different solar system. I mean, there's a multitude of questions people might ask. And did he ever find out where they came from? Uh, Yes. Wow. They didn't tell him. In fact, they communicated with him very, very little. It was Betty who, on the craft, and this came out under hypnosis, but um, they had only one examiner on the two examine both Betty and Barney. And there was a time frame where Betty was alone in the room with the person that she called the leader. And they had finished her examination. She began to trust this being. And she said to him, I know you're not from around here. Where are you from? Where's your home port? And he produced uh, this three-dimensional image of a star map. And that star map had stars on it. Some were as large as nickels. Others were only pinpoints. And she understood that some of those stars uh, had lines between them that were trade routes, and others were expeditions. Now, Dr. Simon, during her hypnosis, gave her the post-hypnotic suggestion that she would be able to draw that map if she could remember it accurately and if it didn't bother her too badly. She did draw it, and then Marjorie Fish saw that map in the first book that was ever written about their experience, The Interrupted Journey. It was written in 1966. So uh, Marjorie Fish ended up uh, going to the university, uh, State University in Ohio, uh, going to the astronomy department, uh, checking out their, their catalog. She had to keep them in the department. They wouldn't permit her to take them home. But she hand copied all of that distance data. And because they didn't have photocopy machines back then, she took the information home and she built 26 different three-dimensional models seeking a match Betty's map. She used monofilament line and beads. And it took her four years to finally find a match. And in one of those three-dimensional structures that she built, doing all the math, to do this she had 256 stars in their proper location this woman was a genius in fact she was a member of mensa Uh, it was an extraordinary project that she set out on and finally when new distance data was released she had a perfect match and then it came time to have it vetted by scientists and that's when my co-author on the book captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience, Stanton T. Friedman, a nuclear physicist, came in. He was called in to find uh, astronomers who would vet the map. Alan Hynek was one, and also the chairman of the astronomy department at Ohio State University, a Dr. Mitchell, vetted Marjorie's work. And also, another person was David Saunders, who served on the Condon Committee. He was the one who discovered the trick memo uh, and uh, it became public that uh, the Condon project was all about debunking UFOs and and, uh, letting the Air Force get out of it. But I'm uh, getting onto a different topic, our map. Uh, They discovered, Marjorie Fish discovered, that the two probable stars that they might have come from were Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 uh, in 
uh, the constellation, the net is what it's called. It's in the southern hemisphere. And those stars are about 29, no, 36 light years. Had that mixed up in my head for a minute. About 36 light years away from our sun. So did they get here from some type of portal or did they use some folding space mechanism? You know, they didn't tell (laughs) Betty and Barney how they got here. But uh, obviously they were using technology that we have not yet invented. And I know how difficult it is to travel through space when, when you're thinking about cosmic rays and your gamma rays and you're thinking about all of the things that space is tossing at you. But we have theoretical physicists who are working on this right now and have theories for how this is done. And if there is an electromagnetic field around that craft, and I can tell you I'm not a physicist. I've only taken one course in physics, but, and that was a long time ago. But uh, they have it explained so that this craft would be protected by this electromagnetic field and might be able to sense anything that's coming toward it and avoid that as well. The beings inside, that presents another problem. Are they going to be alive and in eating and everything else in that craft for the period of time it would take to arrive here? Uh, Perhaps they go into a state of suspended animation and, uh, and then wake up Somehow they're activated when they arrive here on Earth. And certainly uh, you've heard about wormhole theories and that sort of thing. So uh, it's going to be very, very interesting as we learn more about space uh, to, to find out exactly what it is they are using. But maybe they'll let us know in advance, too. Some people say they've already told them. Possibly. And when you said that Betty and Barney had different fillings, based upon the people that they were interacting with or the, um, I guess, you know, extraterrestrials that they were interacting with, were they different looking as well? Or did they look the same uh, as far as humanoid? Yes, Betty and Barney interacted with the same group, the same crew. Um, It's only that Barney was more, felt more threatened um, because he had conscious recall. And that's what was so distressing to him that caused him to end up seeing Dr. Benjamin Simon in the first place. Um, Betty was, hadn't observed them. She didn't remember uh, what they really looked like or what they did until after she was hypnotized, except for she had a series of dreams, which was different than somewhat similar, but a lot different, too, than, than what she stated under hypnosis. Right. So what exactly did they do to Barney and to Betty? They uh, took them out of the car, um, there was a roadblock. And the funny thing is that they heard a series of buzzing sounds on the car after Barney uh, returned to it from the field when he was so terrified about being captured. He went speeding down the road. He told Betty to look up. She only saw a black void, no craft. They heard these series of buzzing sounds. And all of a sudden, they found themselves in a new location on a different road. And, and this is under hypnosis. And they didn't know how they'd gotten there. There were tall trees all around. I'm wondering if the magnetized spots that they found on the trunk of their vehicle that caused a compass needle to spin and spin, actually caused by that craft picking that car up and depositing it on a new road. 